My car wasn't even unpacked yet, all right? It was just sitting in the driveway, all my stuff is in there, and I literally turned right around and uh, drove the four and five and a half hours to school to uh, start my graduate studies that summer. I actually called a friend of mine up and he had uh, space in his apartment for me and uh, so everything worked out great. Now, my mother was really mad, you know. She was hoping to have me around for the summer, hang out with me for a little bit before starting graduate school. And so because she was so mad at my department chair, what she did is she went into the, into the cabinet and got out her favorite coffee mug. She actually bought this 10 years earlier, 1972, at this arts festival. It was her favorite coffee mug. And she gave it to me and she said, hey, so when you first meet your department chair, I want you to be drinking coffee out of this mug just for him. Tell him it's from your mother. So of course, you know, when your mother tells you you gotta do something like that, you gotta do it. So I did, and my department chair thought that was really hysterical, and. Um, um, he thought it was really good. Now what does that have to do with the first lecture? So here's what happened. I'm about three weeks into my master's program, working on the research projects. I get a call from my department chair again, and he says, hey, I need to see you. So I go into the office and he goes, what do you think about teaching a class this fall? <laughs> I was like, my heart just about fell, huh? What do you mean teach a class? He goes, yeah, principles of marketing. We, would, we, we need you to teach principles of marketing this fall. And of course, I'm completely freaked out. You know, it's just, oh my God, I've never taught before. How am I going to do this? It's in the fall. It's only a few weeks away. And uh, like an idiot, I said, well, yeah, of course. You know, I'll, I'll, I'll do that. And then immediately pressed panic mode and went, you know, prepping the whole rest of the summer to get set up to teach this class. So the fateful day arrives. First day of school, you know, I've got my class all lined up. I go into my classroom, which is on the second floor of Willard Building at Penn State. It's a small corner kind of classroom. It holds 60 students in there. And that's exactly how many students I had to start with, 60 undergraduate students. I'm looking at them, and I realize that everybody in the class there is about 19 or 20 years old. I'm not even 22 myself. I'm still 21 years old. I'm teaching a principles of marketing class to a group of undergraduate, undergraduate students. And so my heart is racing 100 miles an hour. You know, I've got no moisture in my mouth whatsoever. I'm just absolutely, nervous isn't the right word. Terrified is the exact word. So what I did is I, I took a deep breath and rolled on with the lecture which I thought went pretty well, you know? I was pretty confident, I'm going through it, and it, and it seemed to have a nice pacing to it, and I get done, and I was like, all right, that was easier than I thought, until I look out at all the bewildered faces that are staring at me out there. Everybody has this sort of confused look, and then I, I turned and I looked at the clock on the wall, and I had blown through an hour and a half lecture in 15 minutes. <laughs> it was just boom, just done. I went, oh no, <laughs> you know, what are you going to do when that happens? So I sat there and I looked at everybody and this, this, this woman who was sitting on the front row, I'll never forget her name, her name is Elena. She looked at me and she smiled and she said, I love your mug, <laughs> which of course meant relax, huh? relax, we got you. So I took another couple of deep breaths and I said to my class, so now that I've given you an overview of what we're gonna cover, let's drill down a little bit deeper. So I restarted the lecture again. This time I went more slowly <laughs> and managed to get through the thing. So I thought it was only appropriate, since that's how I started my first lecture, that <clears throat> I would bring the mug with me to start my last lecture. 47 years old and this thing is still kicking, yeah? Thanks, Mom. Some props are just worth having. So when Melinda asked me to <clears throat> do this uh, last lecture, you know, I immediately said yes. You know, I was just like, oh yeah, this sounds great. I'd love to do this kind of thing. But then I started stressing about it, you know. Not that there's any pressure associated with giving your last lecture that you're ever going to give. 
And uh, as my friends and my wife and, and, and daughters will attest, I've been agonizing over this for months. And, and the most agonizing thing I started with was, well, what am I going to title this? I mean, what do you title a last lecture? Because it's supposed to sort of like thematize it as well. So initially I thought, ah, let's do something kind of Looney Tunish, yeah, something nuts. And so this was my original first title. <laughs> it's all, folks. And yeah, I thought, ah, maybe that's a little too glib. How about something more dramatic, something more intense, yeah? So I thought this one, a horse, a horse, my kingdom for a horse. So I lay dying on the stage. That might, that might be cool. No, not good. <laughs> I didn't think so either. Yeah, all right, maybe a little too much. So I thought, all right, let's turn to some literary stuff here. What could I say? What could I title this? What could I speak to you about that seems to make sense, wisdom-wise, that's in you know, a literary tradition? And so I thought this. Live deep and suck the marrow out of life. Yes, something out of, you know, Thoreau. That would, that would, you guys have heard of this before, yes? You've heard of this, yeah? And also, by the way, was the theme of my second favorite movie in the entire world, which is Dead Poet Society. You guys seen Dead Poet Society? I watch it every fall. It gives me inspiration to, you know, jump back into the fall classes again. Now, some of you may be wondering, well, wait, your second favorite movie? What's your first favorite movie? Did that, that run? Yeah. Mary Poppins. Oh, applause, yes. Yeah, usually people go, wait a minute, what, yeah, yeah, come on, Citizen Kane, Gone with the Wind, something with a little more substance. No, Mary Poppins. That movie has given me the most joy of any movie throughout my life, and finding joy is really, really important. So that's, that's it. So I thought, yeah, all right, I'll go with this. And then I thought, no, I, I need something more, more me, more original, something, something different. And so, as you know, this is the title of the, of the uh, last lecture here, Continuing to Live in uh, Poetics of Imagination. So you're probably thinking that, well, I'm going to talk something about life or living, something having to do with poetics or poetry and, and something having to do with imagination. And you would be right. Imagine that. So one of the courses I teach here at the University of Memphis, as a matter of fact, it's my primary course, is a course called Creativity and Innovation. Uh, it is part of our MBA program. Every single MBA student that comes through the University of Memphis has to come through me. They got to take this course. Let me tell you, that's, it's quite an undertaking to try and teach MBA students how to be creative again, you know, because by the time they get me, they're in their 30s or so, and they've had every ounce of creativity stomped out of them, you know, throughout life. So I've got to try and rebuild it again. I love teaching this course. It's a lot of fun. Um, and we do a lot of imaginative sorts of things in this course. One of the questions that I ask my students every single semester is, what is the source of your creativity? And what's been happening over the years more and more and more is people are saying things like this. This is the majority of responses. Pinterest. Uh, huh? That's the source of your creativity? It, it is Pinterest? You know, and it's like a dagger to my heart. I'm like, oh my God, what happened to imagination? Where did it go? You know, and there's like Pinterest. So. So I, I actually spend a lot of time with them working on redeveloping their sense of imagination. If all, I mean, it takes me like half the course just to restart their imagination. Do you guys know what imagination is? Here, let's do a, let's do a little quick test. All right, so I want everybody to close your eyes. Go ahead, close your eyes. So I want you to, as best as possible, imagine that you're laying by yourself all alone on a beach but the sand on the beach is this emerald green, a brilliant emerald green color. The water that's gently lapping up against the edges of this emerald green sand is a deep tangerine in color. Huh? The air is kind of balmy warm. The sky is jet black. Yeah? And then suddenly in front of you, flies a flock of beagle puppies. All right, show of hands. How many of you actually pictured that? Show of hands. 
yes, imagination is not dead. You can do it. That's your imagination. Yeah, it's, it's, it's what happens up here. Now, what happens when we make our imagined musings tangible? We call that creativity. Does that make sense? So somehow taking what's up in here can suddenly be tangible. You could paint a picture of that, yes? You could paint a picture of what I just asked you to visualize in your head. Uh, you, could, you could write a short story about that. You could create a film. You could, you could take Photoshop and, and go and use all the colors in Photoshop to, to actually create that kind of picture for yourself. There's so many different ways that you could make that imagined vision that I just asked you to do suddenly tangible, and that's what we call creativity. And it's also formally what I mean by the poetics of imagination. What I studied when I was um, in my PhD program is uh, poetics and rhetoric. That was my minor area that I was studying in addition to marketing. And poetics formally defined means the creative forms. Yeah, poetics means creative forms. So when I'm talking about imagination or the poetics of imagination, you know, in a academic or a scientific sense, it would be the creative forms that people use to enact out their imagination. Um, I mean it in a slightly different way, at least for this, uh, this evening. Um, to me, poetics also means playful possibilities. Yeah? Playful possibilities of one's imagination because something magical happens when we apprehend and we think about the world in poetic ways. Yeah? Suddenly, we're not in the world of settled certainties anymore. We're in the world of playful possibilities. When you work with poetry, anything is possible with the language. There are literally no rules. You know, you can, you can paint pictures with words and phrases. I mean, literally anything is totally up to you when you work in the mindset of the poetics. And that's, that's one of the things I try to do in my creativity class. Matter of fact, my students, they all, they all have to do an original poetry assignment, which scares the bejeepers out of them until they actually do it. And, and I tell them, I say, this is, this is so that I can get your mind exercised into thinking about possibilities rather than always looking at what the certainties are or, you know, for God's sake, looking at Pinterest or something like that. Explore, expand, go outward. That's, that's the beauty of, in my mind, of poetics. There's another aspect of poetics that I think is really useful too is because it forces us to think about language and the power that language actually has in our lives. It's more than just the meaning of words, it's how the words sound to your ear. Hmm? It's, it's how the words feel in your mouth. Yeah? There's something in poetics called mouthfeel. Poetry is actually an oral medium. It's meant to be spoken aloud. It's not meant to be read silently. You've got to speak it out loud. That's how the poets want you to, want you to actually read the thing. Because they want you to listen to the sound of the words. They want you to chew on the texture of the words yeah? and get this sort of weird mouthfeel. They want you to feel the rhythm of the phrasings as you utter them, as they're coming out of their mouth. So, you know, when you're thinking about poetry and poetics, it just opens up all sorts of different layers of meaning that people just aren't used to thinking about. So that's why I love it. So as you can imagine, we might do some poetics in here this, uh, this evening, yeah? I keep wanting to say this afternoon, it's this evening, isn't it? Yeah, tonight, whatever it is. So Continuing to Live is actually the title of my favorite poem from my favorite poet, Philip Larkin. And I wanted to start everything off tonight by sharing this poem with you. Well, I guess I can just pop it on the screen here. Has anybody heard of this before? No? No, oh, good. Something new. All right, this will be fun. This is Philip Larkin. This was a photograph taken in the, in the 70s, I believe. Uh, he's, he's not alive anymore. I think, I think he died in 88, to tell you the truth. And uh, Philip is a, a very dark poet. If you've ever read any of his poetry, it's very dark and somber, and, but really fascinating and interesting and intricate. So here's how continuing to live goes. Continuing to live, that is, repeat a habit formed to get necessaries, is nearly always losing or going without. It varies. 
This loss of interest, hair and enterprise. Ah, if the game were poker, yes, you might discard them. Draw a full house, but it's chess. And once you have walked the length of your mind, what you command is clear as a lading list. Anything else must not for you be thought to exist. And what's the profit? Only that in time we half identify the blind and press, all our behavings bare, may trace it home. But to confess on that green evening when our death begins, just what it was is hardly satisfying since it applied only to one man once and that one dying. This poem uh, has been an important part of my life, literally for probably about 37 years, was, uh, when I first ran into it. Um, Larkin's poem is, of course, about what's known as the poet's quest. And the poet's quest is an attempt to describe oneself in terms so unique and such of one's own choosing that one knows exactly what it is that will perish upon one's death. That sounds heady, doesn't it? The poet's quest is to define oneself in terms of your own choosing. The, 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 the quick way to say this is to find out what is it that makes me unique? Yeah? How am I unique? How am I different? from everybody else. That's what motivates the poets. That's what motivates these artists. That's also what motivated Randy Pausch in his last lecture back in 2007. This is his book. And this was really fascinating. So I was, in preparing for this, this lecture, I went back and pulled out my copy of, of the last lecture that a friend of mine gave, in two, he, he gave me in 2008. And I immediately read it and was just, just blown away by this. And then, of course, I watched his, uh, his actual lecture, which was amazing. You, you actually have to go see this. And then, so I, I turned to page nine, and, and, and I don't know if you can see this up here, my, my, my own annotation as I was working, working through this book. And, and he, has, he has a question in there. And I circle it, and I go, aha, the poet's question. And I even drew down there, Larkin's continuing the live poem. And his question is, what makes me unique? I mean, what a kick in the head. This is back in 2008. I was already preparing for this lecture. <laughs> you know, we're writing everything out. So yeah, Randy was asking that as well. But there's another question that I think is going on in Larkin's poem. Uh, it's a little broader. So in addition to what, you know, asking ourselves, well, what is it about me that's unique? I think we also ask the question, or he's, he's, he's also asking the question, what is it that makes us unique among other creatures with whom we share this planet? because we share this planet with a lot of other creatures. And I started thinking about that, and I said to myself, I think it has something to do with art. Because there's something that happens when, when I engage shared art. I feel, I feel more connected. I feel more alive. I feel more human, I think. There's something that happens there that is just uniquely, wow, what it means to be human. There's, there's something about art, you know, when you engage it in that way that is, it's a different kind of emotional. It's a deeper emotionality. It's more limbic, if, if that's a term uh, that resonates with you. It is somehow less encumbered by expectations. It's freer, in a sense. It's, it's what um, this, this great essayist said many years ago, Susan Sontag, if you've ever read any of her works. It's what she argued for what's known as an erotics of art rather than just an aesthetics of art. It's, it's, it's a primitive pleasure that's even more intense than, than other kinds of pleasures. And that's what art is all about. And I think that's what we're driving at when we talk about what makes us uniquely human. But we'll explore that. So that's, that's kind of the setup with the, with the poem. So as I said, this, this poem is very important to me, and that's one of the reasons why I wanted to share it with you. This poem also has a number of intersections in my life that I wanted to share with you. Um, it keeps coming back up in my life in strange ways. And 
So I wanted to share some of those strange ways with you. The first of the uh, strange ways is, um, is this. Um, I, I first ran into the works of, of Philip Larkin back in, again, 1982. And what I was doing at the time was I was, um, I was sound teching for a heavy metal band that I, I did a lot of teching for by the name of Mind Games. <laughs> that was the name of the band, so. Yeah, my other life, I was, I was yeah, heavy metal, the, the whole music scene. So I was, I was sound teching, and um, this, this young woman comes, comes up and she sits down next to me at my soundboard. I was like, just smiled at me and sat there, and she was listening to the music for, I don't know, a few minutes. And suddenly she, she kind of gets up and she leans over and shouts in my ear above the din of the music, I think your mix could use some help. <laughs> Do you mind? And of course, I'm incredulous. I'm sitting, what? You know, or, okay, sure. And I watched her as she leaned over with one hand. She put it on my soundboard and simultaneously moved four of my faders and changed the mix that we were hearing. And by God, if that didn't improve the thing just like that. I mean, it was, it was magic what she did. And she, she, she told me, she said, you know, a couple of your guitar feeds are just way too hot for, you know, this room and everything. She was right. So the band is on break, and the two of us are sitting there chatting and talking, and um, we, we became like instant friends. It was, it's like one of those meetings, you know, have you ever met somebody where, you know, within a matter of just a minute or so, boom, you connect, you're just instant friends. And she said that she was doing a performance next week and she, she needed a sound tech and she asked me to tech her show. And I was like, well, yeah, of course. And uh, thus began um, a three-year friendship with, uh, with her. Um, she was a part-time student at Penn State um, and full-time musician. I don't think I've said her name yet. Her name was Jen, Jenny. And... Uh, so whenever she was in town, I would tech her shows. And the other thing, she was a remarkable, absolutely remarkable musician. She mostly played folk and blues. And um, I, just, I just had the best time teching her music. And she was also a lover of poetry. So she would bring me all sorts of poems and poetry journals, particularly from New York City. And we would, whenever she was in town, we'd get dinner, we'd sit around, we'd, we'd talk about the poems and, and explore these kind of things. And that's where I first met Philip Larkin's work. So this went on for a number of years. And in 1984, Jen picked my acoustic guitar out for me. She said, the guitar that you're playing sucks. I'm going to take you shopping. And so she picked this one out that she jokingly replied, match the color of her hair. It's, a, it's an Alvarez uh, guitar, it's mahogany. It just sounds, sounds gorgeous. It sounds like a really fine cigar tastes is the best way to describe that. It's just so mellow and sweet and smoky in its sound. And I think it gets better over the years. Um, so yeah, Jen picked this out for me. And um, it was in 1985 that um, I got a call from her wife saying that she had died of uh, what was called back then gay cancer. It was AIDS. It was the uh, first of my, she was the first of my friends uh, to actually die of this particular devastating disease. Sadly, of course, you know, she wouldn't be my last friend to die of this particular disease. It had a, had a super impact on me, it really did. So my next encounter with this poem by Philip Larkin um, was again fairly recently. So this summer, I'm moving my office uh, because I was asked to be department chair again. <laughs> I was department chair back in uh, 2002 for a number of years and then I went back to regular faculty and I discovered there's a clause in my contract that I can be drafted back into administration again. So here I am, I'm back in administration again. So I had to move my office. And uh, so I was, I was cleaning things out and I found 
in a box within a box, a paper that a student of mine had written 24 years ago. That's the paper. I was like, oh my god, I, I can't believe I still have this paper. Um, the paper was written by a student of mine, uh, her name was Sharon, PhD student. She was taking a course from me in 1995 called Ethical Criticisms of Marketing Science. It was the very first time that um, I taught this class. And uh, I was, it, was a, it was a class largely based around the philosophy of an American philosopher called uh, Richard Rorty. And this was the primary book that we used called Contingency, Irony, and Solidarity. And if you open this book to chapter two, The Contingency of Selfhood, the chapter starts off with, are you ready for this? Larkin's poem, Continuing to Live. Now the reason I know this, all right, so a friend of mine told me about this book, you know, it came out in 1991, a, a former professor of mine and friend, good, good friend, he calls me up and he goes, hey Greg, because he knows I love Richard Rorty's work, and he goes, hey, have you read his new book? And I go, no, I haven't read his new book. And he said, well, you need to go out and get it. So I did. I went over to what was then Davis Kid and immediately bought it and opened it up and I was like, holy crap! <laughs> It's chapter two, it's my favorite poem. And so Larkin has a whole chapter devoted to this poem. And so that ended up being a large part of this class, this PhD seminar uh, in ethical criticism was a discussion of this particular poem, at least Rorty's discussion of it. So it was really cool. And so this is the first time I'm teaching this course. Sharon was in this course and she, she loved the poem, she hated Richard Rorty hated his work and would argue with me incessantly about why she hated Richard Rorty and everything he had to say. She was my favorite PhD student. I, I, was, I was smitten with her. It was, it, was like an, it was like an instant friendship between the two of us because I loved that she would challenge everything that I ever said. She would fight me on everything. It was just non-stop, it was exhausting. You know, I, I couldn't, you know, the sun came up in the east. No, it didn't, she challenged me on that. It was just, I, I adored her and couldn't wait for her to um, and wait to chair her dissertation, which I was uh, set to do. On, uh, unfortunately, um, Sharon died of cancer in uh, 1998. She had um, a rare cancer, it's called perineal cancer. And uh, I held her hand at uh, St. Francis Hospital the, uh, the evening that she died. And being Sharon that she always was, I mean, you know, I, I jokingly said to her, I said, well, who's going to argue about Rorty with me anymore? And she looked at me and eyes blazing, just, just fierce, smiled and gave me a nice squeeze in the hand. I know you guys probably don't know this but some of the profs that are here. It is an absolute hell of a thing for a teacher to lose a student. That is, a, that is a pain for which there is no medicine. There really isn't. And uh, Sharon was the uh, very first student that I ever lost. Sadly, of course, she was not the last student I ever lost, but she was definitely the first. So jumping forward to 2003, I'm again teaching this seminar. So it's, what is it, five, five years? Well, no, I started teaching the seminar in 1995, so it's now 2003. So I've been teaching it a good eight years. And uh, it's, I want to say it's March, yeah, it's March, March of 2003, teaching this seminar. We're again dealing with Rorty, we're again dealing with this poem, you know, and my students are all arguing over this thing, and we're just going crazy about it, and, and I'm on a break. And um, I walk over from the conference room where we're having the seminar to my office, which is literally right next door, you know, on a 15-minute break, and to check my messages, see what's going on. 
So March at a university for university administrators is a really chaotic time because it's, it's when we do faculty evaluations and there's, there's like spring break and there's all this mayhem going on. It's, it's just the absolute crazy, crazy period of time. And so I was immensely busy. And uh, so I punched up my phone and um, I had one message on there and it was from my dear friend Colleen. Um, Colleen painted that and gave me that particular painting on my 40th birthday. Uh, as a matter of fact, she painted it um, shortly after we, the two of us met, and it was untitled, and she wanted me to title her painting for her. And so I said, I don't know. It, she reminds me of a Heather for some reason. So she's like, deal. So that title of that painting is actually Heather. I just, I love the way the eyes look. There's something that Colleen captured in the eyes that was just, just absolutely magical, hip, hypnotic to me. So, yeah, Colleen uh, was just an absolute, exquisitely talented artist here in Memphis. Very famous artist, too. Her works were displayed all over the world. Um, and I was very fortunate to, to have her as my friend. She, uh, she and I actually met on stage, which I'll, I'll share with you in just a minute. And um, I helped her create a website for all of her, all of her work and uh, did her marketing for her. And in return, I got, I got to learn the, in, the inner workings of how visual artists actually work. I never knew how painters did their stuff before. And it was fascinating. Um, I, I watched her do a painting one day, and she was hysterical. She would, just, she would just sit back laughing as she was throwing paint on the canvas. It, 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 it just sort of appeared out of nowhere. It was like it was this, this magic that would suddenly show up in the thing. I was like, how does this happen? And, and so, so I got a chance to see all of that. So back to the class and the, and the phone call. Um, I, I punched up the phone call, and, and it was actually Colleen that, 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 that had left a message, and she said, call me. Um, and uh, I was like, ah, you know, agonizingly too busy. I, I'll call her later, and later turned into a week. Uh, by the time I finally got around to calling her back, I called up and found out that she had died. Her um, breast cancer came back with a vengeance, and I didn't even know that she was sick again, and I found out from her husband that um, she called me that day to tell me goodbye, and I missed it because I was too busy. Yeah. So this is where Colleen and I met was doing this play 20 years ago called The Best Christmas Pageant Ever. Who in here knows it? Aha! Rob, is that you? I see him through the lights. Okay. So 20 years ago, literally 20 years ago, this was my first show in Memphis. Very first play in Memphis was The Best Christmas Pageant Ever. It was Colleen's first show in Memphis. She was doing the play with her son, Mike. I was doing the play with my daughter, Ray. And we were just having the best time at this. Um, I'll tell you the story how this came about. So my daughter, Ray, who's sitting over there, um, she was in it, and she comes home one night, and she says, our dad dropped out. I was like, what? Yeah, the guy playing the dad just bailed on the show. And so Ray, Ray went to bed, and, and I, I said to my wife, Lori, who's sitting over there, I was like, I'm going to go audition for that. And her eyes popped open and said, say what? What? You, no, you're not. I go, yeah, I am. So I called up the director, and he had me come in and, and audition for it. You know, it took like 30 seconds, and he goes, you're hired, done. And thus began my very long career in Memphis theater was this particular play. But like I said, this is where Colleen and I first met. 
and it had a real special moment for me. It, I was, I was thinking about it. Colleen was the first castmate that I ever had that I would lose. And sadly, of course, she's not the last castmate that I would ever lose as well. So, <clears throat> I have been unbelievably fortunate since that time to have played over 50 characters, 50 different characters on stage, on film, and in audio podcasts over the last 20 years. I mean, I, when we talk about imagination, I, I, I have been very fortunate to be able to act out my own imagination. I, I get to do what I call lived out empathy, you know, in, in the experiences of people that are wildly different from myself. I'm none of these characters up here, but I got to be those particular characters for a time on stage and in front of, in front of a camera. And I got to do that with people that have the same sort of need, the same sort of passion. These are, these are close companions of mine that got, I got to go through that whole process with. It has, I, I, I sat down as I was preparing for this last lecture and I thought about it. One half of my adult life has been spent playing other people. <laughs> what a kick in the head. My poor family over there going, yes, that is true. Half of his adult life has been spent playing other people all over the place. Um, I used to think that I had this really deep need to act. It's this deep clawing need of mine to act. And, and I came to realize fairly, fairly recently that that's not the need at all. I have this deep clawing need to be emotionally connected to people. I have this deep clawing need to empathize. And acting is the vehicle through which I can do that. Um, I think that to be really creative, to be at our finest in being creative, we need, we need to be comfortable being emotionally vulnerable. And when you get to hold the hand of somebody who has that exact same understanding and that exact same need, that's the magic that makes all that happen. And I have been extraordinarily fortunate to be able to hold these poetic hands of all of these people in all of these particular productions for as long as I have. These, these friends of mine to hold their hands and go through those kind of experiences with. It's, 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 it's an amazing, uh, it's amazing. Even more amazing than that is to be able to hold these poetic hands <laughs> with my daughters and my wife <laughs> up top. That is my daughter, Jamie. She's playing Rosencrantz with me in uh, Hamlet. Getting way too emotional, sorry. Over here on the left, in the red, that is Ray, back over there. And uh, that's a picture from uh, the odd couple that we were in together. And then over here on the right, in that uh, really big coat, sorry, hon, uh, is my wife, Lori. And she's playing Miss Peak with me in uh, the play called The Royal Family. Now you're probably wondering who that other smiling, smiling woman is sitting next to Ray. That's actually, that's actually Lena. She is our adopted daughter, I think is what she said, yeah. So yeah, what a, what a, what a thing to be able to share those kind of experiences actually with your family. Um, 
one of these days, we are going to find a production where all, all four of us are going to be on the stage at exactly the same time. I don't know what that production will be, but we'll get there eventually. So speaking of Lori, she is the one person in this room who has been to another last lecture of mine. Yeah, this is her second last lecture of mine. And her first last lecture that she attended was actually 33 years ago, this month, and in this room. Yeah, that groan that you heard over there is her going, oh my God, you're not supposed to do this. So, so that room is actually on the second floor of Willard Building at Penn State. The picture is actually from 2015. We were... Uh, driving on our way up to, uh, to New York and happened to swing through State College. And I was like, oh, awesome. Let's go visit, you know, the old haunt. And so we spent, spent a number of hours roaming around Penn State, where both of us got our degrees from, and, um, you know, visiting, visiting the old bars that we went to and, and stuff like that. And um, I said, let's go, in, let's go in Willard Building. And so sure enough, you know, the building is open. And so we zoom up to the second floor, and I knew exactly where our classroom was, and Lori knew exactly where she sat in that particular classroom. And of course, I had to go up to the board and like draw, draw an equation out on there, because the class that she took was marketing research from me. So now before you guys get all like weirded out, we officially met after the class was over, right? There was like 140 students in this class. She was one of them, but we, we officially met uh, after the class was over and started dating and fell in love and got married two years later in 1988. I am um, an amazingly difficult person to be married to. As you might imagine, all oh, the laughs, yes. Um, I am overly emotional. I am compulsive, I am obsessive, um, I, <laughs> I act like a child way too much, I am reckless when it comes to my own safety, and I break myself constantly, which is why I'm always on the surgeon's table getting fixed. And to borrow a phrase from the musical 1776, I am always first in line to be hanged, and she knows that. Yet she has stuck with me all these years, supported me, encouraged me, picked up all the broken pieces from my adventures and misadventures, and still goes on loving me. <laughs> yeah, I, uh, I owe her a debt that... <laughs> I cannot possibly repay. Back to the poem. This poem that has uh, staggered me for you know, so many years, and particularly these last two stanzas, these things like haunt me. I think about them constantly. What does this mean, you know, and, and is it enough, you know, is it enough to know how we're unique so that at the moment of our death we know what it is that dies, you know, is that enough, is that, is that what it is, you know, is that what Larkin is really up to? And in preparing for this lecture, I was like, no, I've, I've been wrong about this all these years. I used to think that Larkin was a cynic, you know. He was just, he's just a perpetual, you know, obtuse cynic. He's looking at this going, yeah, ah, screw it, it doesn't matter. Because once you find it out, it only applied to one person, and that one's dead, you know, in a minute here. And so he's like, you know, what's the point? I was like, man, that's pretty cynical. But then I, I thought about this, and I said, no. He's not being cynical. What he's doing is cautioning those of us that are on the poet's quest those of us that, you know, revel in playing out our imaginations. I mean, we, we're obsessed with this. We have to jump into our imaginations. And 
I know many of you here in this room are just like that. You, you have to pursue your imaginations to find out what's unique, you know, in your imagination and in yourself. I have been, or I have lived, actually, a um, extraordinary life. I, I have, I am, I am fabulously rich with emotional treasure from all of the adventures and experiences that I've had. And what I've learned is that these treasures, these lush lippenings of julep's lips, demand human touch, adoring adoration of each other's unique moments. And so, <laughs> at the moment of my end, I am finally all with whom I have shared that tiny, fragile space. Avec la cour, I bid you adieu. Thank you.